we turn the lights on in here? It's too romantic. Okay. Okay. Much better. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in thumma amma ba'd. I do want to have about 40 minutes to speak with you everyone. First of all, I'm really, really happy and grateful to have an opportunity to be in Chicago. The crowd in Chicago is absolutely amazing. And so is this conference. Uh, because I want you guys to retain attention and not enjoy some of the best sleep of your lives, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up for about 20 seconds. Get up, everyone. Come on, stand up. It's okay. Let's make this awkward together. Okay. Stretch out a little bit, let the blood flow, you know. Don't stretch too much and accidentally punch your neighbor unless they're your in-laws. Okay. All right, before you get too happy, have a seat. Okay. So the, uh, the challenge I have is that there are two parts to my talk, and I have, again, less than 40 minutes to present some ideas to you. Uh, something like this lecture I have given before, but I've added some things that I didn't talk about before. Uh, usually in a talk like this, when it's supposed to be highly interactive, I need to be able to hear that you've retained what I'm trying to say to you. So every now and again, I'm going to ask you to repeat something. And because they want to maintain the overly romantic low lighting in here, I can't even see the faces in the first row. So the only way I know that you're still alive is if you respond to me in a loud fashion. Is that clear to everyone? Very good. Thank you. So we say in the United States, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, I disagree. I disagree with the pursuit of happiness. I want to start with, the, with a pretty serious point. The Qur'an actually, in its entire discourse, never describes the pursuit of happiness as a real goal. The furthest it goes is the pursuit of contentment, but it never actually acknowledges happiness. Not in the way that we think about happiness. So before we talk about the Qur'an, I want to build this over the next 20 or so minutes. I want to give you pursuits, literal pursuits that you and I have that go far beyond happiness, that take a lot of effort. And let's, by the way, start at point zero. The lowest pursuit that I'm share with you today is actually the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't take much to be happy. Some of you are, you have class at 9 a.m. and you stay home sleeping and it makes you happy. It didn't take much to get happy. Some of you are sitting there, you, instead of going to get up and do something, you sit there and eat cheese puffs and it makes you happy. Swiss rolls can make you happy. Doing nothing, for some people, doing nothing just makes them happy. So do, being happy is not really a, an accomplishment. Obviously it's something that goes away very quickly too, but it's not really something that takes too much effort. As a matter of fact, most of the time when people are talking about being happy and why they're not happy, they usually blame it on other people. It's because of you, I'm not happy. It's because of the weather, I'm not happy. It's because of Donald Trump, I'm not happy, etc., etc. But then there's a pursuit higher than that. And that's, I'm going to build a number of pursuits. And the lowest of them in today's conversation is the pursuit of happiness. Here's the next pursuit. It's the pursuit of cool. It's the pursuit of social acceptability. I'm calling it cool. And what that means is that I want to be like everyone else. I don't want to be the weird one. There are young people that go to high school and they look different from everyone else. And it makes them feel awkward. So they make sure the next time they can go shopping for clothes, they're going to think about what can I wear that when I wear it and walk down the hallway in school, people aren't going to look at me funny or make a comment. I need to be able to dress in a way, look a way, and talk in a way that does not make me stick out like a sore thumb. I don't want to be the black sheep. I don't want to be the odd one out. I want to be able to fit in and be cool like everybody else. And this for a lot of people, for a lot of Muslims, they have that struggle. It's a very real struggle, especially for a lot of Muslim youth. Because the kinds of pressures they have are enormous. It's very hard to fit in. There are comments they hear all the time. Our girls go through this struggle every day, especially the ones that wear a hijab. It's not easy. They stick out and people make mean comments to them. 
It's the school environment can be a very brutal environment. But regardless, for some people, this becomes a pursuit. As a matter of fact, everything they do. I've even met young people, they don't even like listening to certain kinds of music, but they only do so because they're all the other friends do it, and they'd feel weird if they didn't do it. They dress a certain way because if they didn't, their friends would actually make fun of them. This becomes a pursuit for people. And by the way, this is not just something that affects young people. It affects old people too. It affects our elders too. They want to fit in too. They want to make decisions based on what other people are doing. They want to move into a neighborhood because everybody else moved into that neighborhood. What are people going to say? Their financial decisions, their business decisions, their family decisions, even their, who they're going to let their kids marry decisions are all, almost all the time based on what they think is socially acceptable. They don't think about what's best for them or what's best for the family, but rather what's socially acceptable. That becomes more important. So that's the pursuit of cool. But then there are some people that go even at, at a higher level of pursuit. What are you after? What are you working for in life? And that next pursuit for some people is the pursuit of popularity. The lowest was happiness. What was next? Cool. What's third? Popularity. I don't just want to be cool. I want to be the coolest. For some people, it's not enough that they're cool. They blend in. They need to wear the most expensive clothes. They need to be the loudest in the bunch. They need to get the most attention. They need to be seen as you know, the one that everybody else wants to be around. These are people that live off of attention. They need attention. There are other people that are perfectly happy being invisible in life. There are people that go to your school and work in your offices, and they work there for 10 years, and you don't even know they exist because they'd rather be invisible. And then there are people who live off of attention. They need it. And the way they get it is any, by any means necessary. Some celebrities are like that nowadays. They're good examples. They'll do anything to get attention. If they're musicians and their music doesn't sell anymore, then maybe they'll just get involved in some scandal. At least some other magazine, some tabloid is going to mention them. At least they're getting attention somehow. So there's the pursuit of happiness, followed by the pursuit of what? I forgot. Cool. It's followed by the pursuit of what? Popularity. Popularity. And some people live for that. That's what they do. That's what their life is about. Above popularity, however, there are people who pursue something even higher. And they pursue prestige. They pursue prestige. Let me tell you what that means. For a lot of people in this world, it's not actually what you've accomplished, but the fact that you look like a big deal. The fact that you're associated with a big deal. So the brand of clothes you wear is more important than the intelligence you have. The words you have to say, the work you've actually done, the kind of car you drive becomes really important. So for some of you whose families are not doing so well financially, and your dad drives a 1988 Buick something, you'd rather be dropped off four blocks before your school. Because you can't be associated with a beater. If it was a BMW, if it was a Mercedes, if it was, you know, it was something worth showing off, then you'd be dropped off at the front of the school. There are people who love telling you which college they go to. By the way, I'm asking for directions to the airport. The guy says, by the way, I went to Harvard. Thanks, but where's the airport? <laughs> you feel the need to let people know that your self-worth has now increased in some way because your name is associated with Harvard. Your clothes, your, your body is associated with brand name clothes. You know, something. And, they, and for some people, it's actually who they've met, who they've affiliated with. You know who I met? You know who I have a selfie with? You know? It's not actually about you, it's about these associations. You could go to Harvard and be failing all of your classes, but you still get to say, I go to Harvard. You could say that. But at least it looks good on paper. Prestige. And for a lot of people, their entire life is about the image of prestige. That's all it is. That's all they work for. I'm going to start from scratch again. What was the lowest pursuit? Happiness. What was above that? Cool. What was the third? Popularity. And above it is what? Prestige. Some of you, your parents have ingrained in you that you must graduate out of med school because unless you're a doctor, you will have no prestige in society. Nobody will want to marry you. 
And until you do this, you will have absolutely no prestige. Some of you are working and you rent an apartment and your parents are saying until you buy a house in a mortgage that is far beyond anything you can make economic sense of, until you own a house, you have no prestige. Anybody who has any respect owns a house at least. And out of prestige, people put themselves in social difficulty, psychological difficulty, economic difficulty, spiritual difficulty. Just out of prestige. But then there are people who pursue even higher. We've made a list of quite a few things, but we're going to keep going. There are people whose lives are dedicated beyond prestige to one thing and one thing only. الذي جمع مالا وعدده Money. They don't care about prestige. They don't care about looking cool. They don't care about being popular. They don't care about happiness. They don't care about anything. All they care about is what? Money. And these people are good at making money. They wear smelly, dirty t-shirts. They look like they're homeless, but they're making 30 grand a day. They know how to make money. And they're driving like the ugliest car. They don't spend it on anything. If you look at them, if you met them, you would not know that they are worth millions of dollars, but they are. Because these people are focused. They know that, the, that happiness or cool or popularity or prestige isn't worth it. The real deal is how you make money. And these people are smart and they work hard. They work hard. These are rigorous people. They know how to get, get the job done. They know how to make that money. They live a miserable life too, by the way. <laughs> because they spend all of that energy and they have, they have a God-given gift. Maybe they're entrepreneurs or they're really good at their career and they know how to get those promotions. They exhaust every bit of their energy in this direction and they leave behind a family that's been abandoned. They don't have much in terms of friends. They don't really even take care of their own health. They are miserable in every other aspect of life. The only time you see them come alive is when there's talk about the business, when there's talk about the next investment, when there's talk about moving the career further. That's, that's all they pursue. So that's money. I forgot the list. What was the first one? Happiness. Then? Cool. Then? Popularity. Then? Prestige. And on top of that one? Money. And then there are people, and by the way, as I go up, it takes more effort, if you notice. Happiness, eat a banana and be happy. It doesn't take no effort. Being cool requires a little more effort. You, got, well, you want to get popular, you got to do some stuff. You got to make some more effort. You want to get prestige, it's going to cost you. You want to get to make money, you're going to put a lot of work in. You understand? As we go higher up, it takes more and more grit, more and more work, more and more effort on your part. Now the pursuit above that is actually pretty amazing. It's the pursuit of excellence. It's the pursuit of excellence. There are people among the audience here that are wired that way. They don't care about money or anything else I just mentioned. All they care about is being number one. They, wanna, they don't want to just, they, they just pass the class. They want to be the highest grade. They don't want to graduate. They want to be the valedictorian. They don't want to be the basketball player that made the team. They want to be the MVP. And they're never, these people are never satisfied. They're never satisfied. They could get a hundred on every exam and they're still like, I need to do more. I'm not doing enough. They could be winning in every, they could be an athlete and they are ahead of their entire team. They've broken every record and they still don't take a rest because they're constantly fighting, not against an opponent, but against themselves. They're constantly looking to say to themselves, I haven't done enough. I haven't pushed enough. I haven't gone far enough. And these are some incredible people in the world. These are people, you'll find these people athletes. You'll find them, some of these are entrepreneurs and scientists. Some of these people are researchers. Some of these people are activists, community, community activists. But they have one thing in common. This grit. They're constantly, constantly pushing themselves further. They're not like if they were in a race and they were ahead of everybody else by a hundred feet, they wouldn't slow down. They wouldn't say, well, at least I'm winning. No, I've got to beat my own record. That's how these people think. They are in pursuit of what? Excellence. Ex and these are very few people in the world. Most of us, when we get to a passing grade, we're like, ah. Most of us, if we're doing okay, if we, if, you know, if we got a B, you would be happy. These guys, they would be crying if they got an A. You met some of these psychos in school. They get a 99 and cry about it. You met those people? You want to slap them across the face so hard. You got a 75 and you went to Umrah to thank Allah. But these people, 
got a 99. And they're like, how did I make that one point mistake? And then they're arguing with the teacher for extra credit, and you just want to run them over after the school day is done. Right? That's what you want to do with them. But you understand they're wired differently. They're not like you and me. They're different. This was the pursuit of excellence. I'm going to make sure you guys know this list, so let's start over again. The lowest pursuit is that of happiness, followed by cool, followed by popularity, followed by prestige, followed by followed by but that's not the end. There are people that aren't even being excellent isn't enough because excellence is actually just about yourself. That's still just about yourself. You want to be better than anybody else and yourself. You want to crush your own record. It's still focused on you. Then there are people that say life is bigger than just aspirations that I have for myself. I want to change the world in some way. I want to leave an impact on this planet. I want to make my neighborhood a better place, my school a better place, my government a better institution, my country a better nation. I want to help children around the world. I want to help this industry or that industry. I don't just want to be the top engineer. I want to be the top engineer that develops you know, clean water programs and invents things that are going to help villages across the world that have a clean water problem. I don't just want to be a doctor. I want to create solutions that can provide Medical, medical support to places and people who can't afford it. I want to change the world for the better. I, don't, I lose sleep over this all the time. And they, by the way, they have the drive for excellence already. But it's, that excellence is not for themselves, it's for others. These people are concerned with impact. And there are a lot of young people today that are graduating out of top schools across the United States, Europe, Australia. They get their MBAs, they have 4.0 GPAs, they can get six-figure salaries even in their senior year of college, and they turn it down because they want to work for a nonprofit for not even half the salary. Because they, what drives them is not money, it's not even excellence, what drives them is what? Impact. What drives them is impact. And by the way, people that are driven by impact are very few people in the world. Most people just want to think about themselves. Most people just want to think about their own. And just be, so long as they can be happy, they're fine. Actually, most people are just at the level of happy. If I have my lunch and dinner, I'm happy, I'm good. I don't need anything else. So you're, as we move up, it takes more and more effort. And as we move up, it takes more, it's lesser and lesser and lesser people. This was the first part of my talk, this pursuit. One last time, I'm gonna annoy you one last time. I promise I won't do this again. The lowest pursuit is happiness. Doesn't take much effort. Most, some people wanna blend in and they are in the pursuit of what? Cool. Beyond that, some people want to get beyond cool and get everybody's eyeballs on them. These are, the, these are the people pursuing what? Popularity. Beyond that, people want to look and be, be associated with respect and esteem. These people are in pursuit of prestige. People that don't care about any of that stuff, what matters to them is money. Thank you. There's money guy over here. Okay, good. Beyond money, there are people who don't even care about the money. What do they care about? Excellence. And above them are people that are in pursuit of what? Impact. Impact. Now I'm going to stop that. We're going to come back to it. And I'm going to share with you an analogy in the Quran. The Quran is compared to multiple things. In the Quran itself, in order for you to understand what the Quran is, Allah gives you analogies. And one of the most powerful analogies in the Quran for the Quran itself is rain. It's rain. Anzalna minas sama'i ma'an fasalat awdiyatun biqadriha. Allah sends water from the sky. And the simple parallel is that Allah sent the Qur'an from the sky just like He sends water from the sky. The water that comes from the sky gives life to the earth, the dead earth. Just like the Qur'an that came down gave life to dead hearts. It brings the hearts back to life. So the parallel is very simple. The Qur'an is compared to what? To rain, okay? Now, let's think about rain deeply a little bit in the way Allah describes it because when Allah is describing rain and the effect of rain, what He's also talking about is the Qur'an and the effect of the Qur'an. That parallel, once you understand it, then you'll understand that every time Allah is talking about water and what water does, He's actually also talking about the Qur'an and what the Qur'an does, what revelation does. Now, one of the descriptions of rain is that it produces vegetation, it produces life. 
but it doesn't produce the same kind of life. It's the same water that falls all over the earth, but the kinds of fruits and the kinds of trees, the kinds of flowers, the kinds of grass, the kinds of vegetation and shrubs that come out of the earth are all very diverse. All very diverse. As a matter of fact, even the fruits that look the same. Maybe there's an orange tree here, and there's an orange tree in somewhere in Southeast Asia, the orange is going to taste different, isn't it? It's not going to be the same. So even though the water is the same, what it produces in fruits and benefits and life is actually very, very, very diverse, isn't it? This is important to understand because the Qur'an is one and the same. The Qur'an is one and the same. But the way it inspires you, and what it inspires you to do, and the good that will come out of you, the way that you're going to blossom and bloom, the fruits that you're going to produce, are not like the person sitting next to you. I am standing up here on stage, and I've got this mic in front of me, and this is what I am capable of doing. But that does not mean that that is the capability Allah gave you. Perhaps you are a different kind of tree, a different kind of shrub, a different kind of plant. There is not one thing to do for Islam. There, is a countless, there are countless numbers of things to do for Islam. The earth, all of the earth needs water. And all of it will produce vegetation. And all of that vegetation and all of that produce, produce has its own purpose. Think about that and understand that every one of you has unique potential. And your life is going to be a life, if you understand the analogy of the Qur'an, plants have an impact, don't they? Plants have a positive impact on their environment. Not only are they releasing oxygen, they're also providing food for the environment around them. They're sustaining the entire ecosystem, aren't they? So they are fed by the water, and now they are the means by which the earth is fed. We are fed by revelation, and we are going to be the means by which the world will be a better place. The world will be fed, and it won't be fed in one way. You guys, each one of you, have unique talents, unique creativities, unique potential. Not only is it your job to discover that, but then it becomes your job incumbent upon you, inspired by the Qur'an, that you are not a pursuer of happiness, nor a pursuer of cool, nor popularity, nor prestige, nor money, nor excellence. You are going to be in pursuit of impact, inspired by the word of Allah. And by the way, excellence is a byproduct. It will come anyway if you're properly inspired. And money, Allah will throw it in your hands. You won't even have to ask for it. The risk will come and it will come pouring, pouring down. The provision will come from Allah. It will come if you have the right mindset, if you have the right mentality. But you and I have to now start thinking about being people of impact. You guys, so many of you are going to high school and college. What do you want to do? I don't know. What are you going to major in? I'm thinking about accounting, but I don't like math. Pursuit of stupid. Have some direction, for God's sake. Young people. I don't want to hear, this generation should not be saying, I don't know, I'm thinking about it. No. You know, I don't feel like doing this. This one makes me really happy. That's why I'm doing a major in underwater basket weaving, because it makes me happy. Stop with the pursuit of happiness. Think about the pursuit of impact. You guys, this generation is going to be the nation, the generation that produces impact. And nobody is more capable of giving impact than people that have the right water, the right fuel. And no ummah in the world has the Qur'an except these people. You people. Once you're inspired, the change you will bring, the good you will bring, no one else is capable of bringing. The world is dying and it's waiting for you. It's waiting for you to wake up. It's waiting for you to take that inspiration. We are going to produce a generation of people that are amazing in the fields of psychology and sociology and political science and history and architecture and medicine and all of them will not be, they're not going to become doctors because it makes a lot of money. They're not going to become doctors because their mama will be proud and they can get married easily. They're going to become doctors because they want to make the world a better place, inspired by the word of Allah. That's the kinds of doctors we're looking for. If you became a doctor, you know, if you became a doctor because your daddy told you to, then I, I pray to Allah, I am not your patient. 
Because when you go into surgery, and I'm lying down there, may Allah protect us all from surgery, but one day if you are into surgery, and you're holding the knife, this one's for you, father. Like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know? We have to think much bigger than ourselves. This is what this ummah does. That's the concept of Sadaqa Jariya. How many times have you heard the story of the old man who at his deathbed, he's already dying, he's still planting a tree in the ground. That tree will come out much after he's dead. He's still planting it because he's thinking about impact. He's thinking about leaving a legacy of goodness behind. And so ingrain this in your head. Your life will be a pursuit of impact. Now, I, there are two words here, pursuit and impact. And so that's the next thing I want to talk to you about. When I come up here and speak, Alhamdulillah, Thumma Alhamdulillah, with the blessing of Allah and the incredible organization of this, this, this uh, you know, of Masikna and what they've done here, there are so many people in the audience and somebody says, I want to have impact too. I'm going to give a lecture. And two people showed up. And then you get depressed and say, well, I don't have any impact. I, I got heard the speech about impact and then I was like trying to impact the world and stuff and then nothing happened. So I'm gonna go back to being happy again. Turn on the PlayStation 4, you know? Let me tell you something. This is where we, the people of Quran, are different from everyone else. We are actually not interested primarily in impact. We are interested primarily in the pursuit of impact. You will live your life pursuing because you and I understand impact itself comes from Allah. The effort comes from you, but the result comes from Allah. Nuh alayhi salam, his entire life is pursuit. But if you study his progress, how many people actually listened to him? How many people, was he actually, if there was a, it was, if there was a progress report at the end of every year for Nuh salam, how many converts did we get this year? Let's put a chart here. Instead of going this way, it's flat for like centuries. And there's a little bloop, like one person took shahada. And you look at that and say, this, this is not having any impact. They're not actually getting any results. Maybe we should, maybe, maybe this isn't worth doing. No, 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 no. You aren't inspired to create impact because you know impact actually never comes from you. You're inspired to create or to, to give your life to what? The pursuit. And once your pursuit is genuine and it is sincere and it is filled with the, the right kind of love of Allah, then Allah will give it impact that you can't even imagine. You can't even imagine. It's beyond you. It is beyond you. There are two examples I want to give you and I'm done. I don't want to make this a prolonged lecture. This is going to be a record. I'm going to finish before the allotted time. Okay? Two things I want to share with you. The first of them is the Prophet wasallam preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching in Mecca and it's not going anywhere. And he decides to go to Taif. You remember the story? And he goes to Taif and he is treated far worse than he was ever treated in Mecca. He's almost stoned to death. He's bleeding. His shoes are slipping off because of the blood. And he's standing there praying. Nobody, not one soul took shahada. Nobody took shahada. If you look at it from the outside, this entire exercise had how much impact? Zero. It had no impact. And yet in the Quran, قُلْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيَّ أَنَّهُ اسْتَمَعَ نَفَرٌ مِّنَ الْجِنِّ فَقَالُوا إِنَّا سَمِعْنَا قُرْآنًا عَجَبًا The Messenger of Allah, after the incident of Taif sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is praying by himself, by himself. And a group of jinn passed by, and they all took shahada. And not only did they take shahada, they became preachers for Islam and converted countless other jinn to Islam. The Prophet ﷺ did not see any impact with his eyes. So Allah told him there was impact in the world of the unseen. That's not up to you, that's up to Allah. That's what Allah does. So don't, don't imagine that you're making an effort and you're not getting the numbers, you're not seeing the growth, you're not seeing what you wanted to see with your, with your own eyes and just because you don't see it, there is no impact. There is always impact. 
Because what you have to show before Allah, if I, I have to tell you this, I have to tell you this, I have to develop and internalize a particular kind of attitude. Whether I showed up here with this microphone and nobody was, one person was sitting here and even they walked away, or all of you are sitting here, I should have no less motivation. I should have no less energy, no less dedication because I didn't come here for you. I came here because of a pursuit. That's the mentality I have to inculcate in my mind. That's an ironclad will. This is the willpower of messengers of Allah. That's the legacy they left behind والسلام, They did not look at what was in front of them and get depressed. They kept at it. These were people of pursuit. And then Allah gave them impact. I was going to give you two examples, I'm going to give you three. Since Ibrahim السلام, was mentioned, Ibrahim السلام, كانت أمتن, كانت أمتن. he was an ummah by himself. And one of the meanings of that is he was always by himself. He didn't have many followers. And he traveled from land to land to land. And he ends up in this desert, not a pretty place. And he's standing in that desert with his son and he's making dua that people should come to this place, this desolate, hot, not nice weather place called Mecca. <laughs> he's standing there praying that people should come here from every nook and cranny of the world. Did he see the results of that prayer in his lifetime? No. Can you imagine if Ibrahim السلام, could see what happens at the Haram now? The entire, there, there's not a continent left on this earth where there isn't a believer facing that same direction. And even if he's not physically at the house of Allah, his heart is there, her heart is there. And that is the impact of someone who made the right pursuit and asked Allah genuinely. That one dua, and we are still the answer of the dua of Ibrahim السلام. Here's my last example, particularly dedicated to the youth and what your lives are supposed to mean. I have talked about this example countless times, but I don't care. I don't get tired of it. I don't get tired of it. And I'm not interested in always telling you new things. The messengers came and they used to say the same thing over and over again. And they didn't say, what new speech am I going to give today? They didn't think like that. A reminder is exactly that, something that's already been said before. It doesn't matter. فَذَكِّرْ إِنَّ فَعَتِ الذِّكْرَى Remind. Reminder has its own benefit. Even if you've heard something before, hearing it again has a new benefit. And hearing it again tomorrow will have a new benefit again. So you don't just say, I already heard this, I got this. No, no, no. Our hearts need it again. Our hearts need to be replenished. It's different from our minds. You can't say, I drank water yesterday, I don't need it today. That's why Quran is compared to the rain. It already rained last year, we don't need it anymore. No, 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 you do. It's the same drops, yes they are. But you need them to sustain yourselves. I'm gonna share one thing with you from the story of the young men of the cave. These young men have no resources, they have no education, they have no Islamic education, they don't even have a messenger with them, nothing. They don't have exhaustive knowledge. And they are now in a very bad place. They are inside a cave. A cave is not a comfortable place. A cave is not a comfortable place. Especially out in the wilderness, there's danger of animals, snakes, predators, whatever else. They're inside that cave, and you know they went to, Allah put them to sleep, yeah? There's, the way Allah speaks is important to note. Allah could have said, they remained in the shade. They remained in the shade. What that would mean, everybody would understand, even if the sun came up or sun came down, that they were still in such an angle that the sunbeams never hit them. And the easy way to say it, khayrul kalami ma qalla wa dalla, is, you know, they remained in the dhil. Baqaw fi dhil. They remained in the shade. But Allah doesn't say that. He says, وَتَرَى الشَّمْسَ إِذَا طَلَعَتْ تَزَاوَرُوا عَنْ كَحْفِهِمْ ذَاتَ الْيَمِينَ وَإِذَا غَرَبَتْ تَقْرِضُهُمْ ذَاتَ الشِّمَالِ وَهُمْ فِي فَجْوَةٍ مِّنْهُ كَلَامٌ طَوِيل Allah elaborates. You will see the sun as it comes up. It deviates just around them to the right. And when it comes up, when it's setting down, it cuts across them. It doesn't hit them. It lends them a favor to the left. While they are in a wide open space right in between. Why did Allah depict this this way? Because the language is making it very clear. The sun was supposed to hit them very directly. But Allah Azza wa Jal, instead of describing them in the shade, Allah described Allah moved the rays of the sun around them so they could stay comfy. And the sun would come up and the sun would go down. When people pursue Allah, when people pursue only impact in the akhirah, then Allah will make the sun, the sun submit to the service of people that are asleep. 
They're sleeping and Allah is serving them. The world around you will come at your service. There are people that are running after the world. But when you come to the service of Allah and you truly pursue impact inspired by the word of Allah, let me tell you something. The world, the sun, the moon, the earth, the skies, the seas, they will be at your service. Allah will submit all of this creation for you in its true meaning. These people had no money, no resources, and look at what Allah will do for them. And if Allah can do that for youth then, who were not prophets, who were not sahaba, who were not knowledgeable in revelation, they didn't have any of that. that you know what that means? They are no different from the youth today. There's a reason the Prophet told us وسلم, to recite Surah Al-Kahf when times get tough. There's a reason to remind ourselves of a time when there will be young people who will say we have absolutely no resources, nobody's coming to our aid, we don't know how to make any impact, and yet Allah will give them, He'll give them aid from where they couldn't even imagine. He'll provide from where you can't even imagine. This is the generation that will relive the legacy of the young people of the cave. You are the people. This is what we have to rise to, to, to young people. You guys, your lives need to mean a lot more than just the next movie that's coming out. Every tweet, every Facebook post, every Snapchat about one frivolous thing or the next, I'm not gonna tell you it's haram. I'm just gonna tell you your life means a lot more than that stuff. I'm not here to give you a fatwa. Your life is so much bigger. It's so much bigger, man. You got big things to do. Learn to think big. Learn to think Allah has given you the honor. So many people in the world that don't have La ilaha illallah, you do. Allah says, This is the last thing. I'm still going to be ahead of time. I promise. Watch. He is the one who selected you. The word in Arabic is ijtiba, which is different from istifa and ikhtiyar. There are different words in Arabic for choice. The word ijtiba from Jabu actually comes when you make a selection based on a particular quality. In other words, you have been selected to become people of La ilaha illallah because Allah sees something in you that qualifies you for His pursuit. That He did not see in other people. He honored you with that. You're not Muslim because your parents are Muslim. You're not Muslim because you happen to be Muslim. You're Muslim because Allah sees something in you. You don't even see it in yourself yet. It's time you start seeing it in yourself. It starts, it's time you start expecting more from yourself. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. The second meaning of that ayah is Allah did not burden anyone except with their own potential. Learn to exhaust your own potential. Recognize what you're capable of. Don't sell yourself short. This ummah is not about mediocrity. It is about pushing the boundaries of what more and more and more we can pursue. May Allah Azza wa Jal make this the generation of impact that makes my generation and the previous generations jealous of what you were able to accomplish. I still have five seconds. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.